Welcome to the Health Trip Podcast. My name is Jill Foos. I'm a functional medicine and integrative nutrition health coach. I created this podcast to bring you along as we travel down intriguing science-packed roads, debunking old medical paradigms and perusing new innovative therapies and modalities with the finest functional medicine doctors, practitioners, and like-minded biohackers while living our best life. Enjoy the show. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode on the Health Trip Podcast. Are you a fat burner or a sugar burner? Are you metabolically flexible? While these terms are often tossed around in news articles, podcasts, and on blogs, most people remain in the dark on what they mean, which is best, and how to get from A to Z. One of the top complaints I hear from my midlife women clients is that they are gaining weight around their midsection for no reason. Well, we know there's a reason, we just haven't discovered it yet, but women are feeling confused and frustrated as to why they are gaining weight when all the other variables in their life haven't changed. They're still eating the same diet, they're attending their usual exercise classes, yet the weight is coming on. With weight gain comes a slew of other health issues such as fatigue, disrupted sleep, increased anxiety, depression, stress, joint pain, brain fog, and more. And underneath the hood of weight gain and menopause, women open up the door to chronic disease states, such as an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease, cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and cancer. So knowing what metabolic flexibility is and how it pertains to your overall health and wellness is quite important to your longevity plan. Don't worry, I have invited a powerhouse of a guest who is going to break it all down for us. I know that many of you are new to a more functional medicine and root cause approach to your overall health, and this is somewhat overwhelming, but I encourage you to keep moving forward in the journey, in your quest to heal yourself until new healthy habits become your new baseline normal. My guest is JJ Version. She is a triple board certified nutrition expert and fitness hall of famer. She helps people stay fired up and healthy as they age, so they feel the best they've ever have at 40 plus years old. She's a prominent TV and media personality whose previous features include co-host of TLC's Freaky Eaters, two years as the on-camera nutritionist for weight loss challenges on Dr. Phil, and numerous appearances on PBS, Dr. Oz, Rachel Ray, Access Hollywood, and The Today Show. She also speaks regularly and has shared the stage with notables, including Tony Robbins, Dr. Mark Hyman, and Dan Buettner. She is the author of four New York Times bestsellers, The Virgin Diet, The Virgin Diet Cookbook, JJ Virgin's Sugar Impact Diet, and JJ Virgin's Sugar Impact Diet Cookbook. Her latest book, Warrior Mom, Secrets, Seven Secrets to Bold, Brave Resilience, shows caregivers everywhere how to be strong, positive leaders for their family while exploring the inspirational lessons JJ has learned as she fought for her son's own life. JJ hosts the popular Ask the Health Expert podcast with over 14 million downloads and growing. And she is also a business coach and founded the premier health entrepreneur event and community, the Mindshare Collaborative. Just a quick medical disclaimer. By listening to this podcast, you agree not to use this podcast as medical advice or for making any lifestyle changes to treat any medical condition in either yourself or others. Consult your own physician for any medical issues that you may be having. This entire disclaimer also applies to any of my guests on my podcast. So sit back, relax, open your mind, and let's dive in with JJ Virgin. Hi, JJ. Welcome to the Health Trip Podcast. I am so happy to have you here today. And I am thrilled to be here with you. I am sitting here with one of the first books I ever read on health and fitness. And You're kidding. No, I, I'm, I'm not. I, I found it at a used bookstore a long time ago because this was your first book. This was not my first book. No? No. Oh, but this was your first New York Times bestseller. This was my first New York Times bestseller. This, okay. was, this was why health people also need to learn marketing if they want to get their message out into the world. <laughs> Yes, very true. Yes, but such an amazing book that you wrote a while ago and all such relevant information. And um, you're just so forward thinking. You were way ahead of your time because we're we're just having a lot of these conversations now about a lot of the information in that book, The Virgin Diet. And it's incredible how long it took to come to a more mainstream platform to talk about these things. I know, and I was crazy back then. I literally, Jill, I've been in this business for 40 years 
And um, when I was in graduate school, all the research was being done on cardiovascular training, aerobic training, and all everything we were being taught was that in order to lose weight, you had to create a 500 calorie deficit if you wanted to lose a pound a week, right? Yeah. And all the research was on aerobic exercise. And I go, that doesn't make any sense. I'm going to do strength training because it will change your metabolism. Like, I don't understand this. And I was like this rebel rogue person. And then I did this next thing where I was like, it cannot just be calories in, calories out. This makes no sense. Our body's not a bank account. It's a chemistry lab. And I was like, they're just like, oh gosh, you know, <laughs> crazy person over there. So, but you know, I think here's the thing. God bless the scientists for doing all the research. And when you're in the field, you have to actually, what you do has to work or you have angry clients, right? Like no one's going to hire you to make them, you know, gain weight and get sicker. Much as I can tell and have poor energy, et cetera. So, you know, I just was, was taking everything I was learning in school and going, well, that's not working. Right. <laughs> Right. So what is, you know, and if, so, if your clients cannot see results, they can't buy in. No, no. And why should they? Exactly. Now, sometimes, you know, sometimes when your body's under construction, it can take a little bit of time for things yes. to shift, but generally there still are signs all along the way. It may not be the signs they want, but at least you can give them signs that healing is occurring. Right. Yes. Um, but you got to show them something. Otherwise, wh what are they doing with you? You wouldn't hire a contractor to build your house and they're not showing up and you just keep paying them. And that is a great segue into today's topic, which is metabolic flexibility. And I always tell my clients, Rome wasn't built in a day. So however long it took you to get to this place today, isn't going to take 24 to 48 hours to undo. It's going to take months, if not, could be years for some people. And so yes. metabolic flexibility is one of these very important terms that everyone should know, but yet everybody is still very confused on what it means. So I'd love to start out the podcast with you helping us break down what is metabolic flexibility. And I love that you did the Rome thing. I had a great mentor in nutrition early on who was like, you know, first of all, the sicker you are, the farther back in your ancestry, you should go in terms of how you live. Mm -hmm. um, but he also would say like, if you've been sick for 10 years, like this is not going to three week cleanse isn't going to fix this, Exactly. <laughs> so, you know, let's get some context into it. And, you know, I really simplified the concept in sugar impact diet. And I may have done a disservice in looking back at it, you know, cause I'm always trying to look at something and go, how do I make this as, as simple to follow as possible? Yep. It won't be easy but simple. And I like to do one thing at a time, because I know that if you have two things, then you're likely to do no things. So True. that's always my thought whenever I'm working on any type of program is how do I make this? What if it was simpler? How do I make this as simple as possible and then build on wins? And I wrote the sugar impact diet after the virgin diet, because everybody seemed to be asking about sugar, because it was one of the foods I was pulling out because of course, what it does to your gut. And so my simple way to des describe this was you were a sugar burner or a fat burner. The reality is if you've got great metabolic flexibility, because then people are like, oh, I just want to be a fat burner. I'm like, no, you don't. You right. want to be both because if a lion's chasing you, you better be able to burn sugar or you are going to get eaten. You'll likely get eaten anyway, but we don't really have too many lions around. So we're okay. But we've got to be able to use the right fuel source in the right situation. The challenge is that we've damaged our metabolism. I mean, now it's what, less than 7% of people are metabolically healthy. Yep. And by the way, you do not lose weight to get healthy. You get metabolically healthy so that your body can use stored fat for fuel, right? It can build muscle. So this whole idea of like lose weight, no, because if you're losing the wrong kind of weight because you're a sugar burner, not a fat burner, and now all of a sudden you're breaking down muscle yep. and you're not losing fat, you just made yourself worse, not better. So it's really, when I think of metabolic flexibility, it's the ability to shift into the right fuel reserve for whatever you're doing. So most of the day that would be burning fat for fuel. However, if you're at the gym and you're pushing hard, then that's using sugar for fuel. Generally, your brain's going to use more sugar for fuel. Your heart's going to use it. So what's going on, which is the right fuel source for that. And then our body, depending on what you're doing with it, it's going to prioritize things. If you're drinking alcohol, that's what it's burning first. Cause it's got to get rid of it. Cause it's toxic. Then if you're eating a bunch of carbs, it's going to handle those next. So 
we really want to get to a point where we're eating correctly for our bodies and our bodies are able to use the right fuel in the right situation. And that to me is true metabolic flexibility. That is a great analogy, a great breakdown. Now, what are symptoms of not being metabolically flexible? How do you know if you're not healthy in that way? Yeah. And here's the thing we're really looking at, like when I think of it, I really think of someone who's more insulin resistant, they can't yeah. access stored fat for fuel, but you can create metabolic flexibility, inflexibility the other way where your body doesn't know what to do with carbs. If you're like been on keto forever. So you could do it both ways. I just think that's not most people. For most people, when we look at that less than 7% of the population are metabolically healthy, it's insulin resistance. Yes. That's the key problem there. And so how, are, how do you know that that is you? And I'll tell you back early, early days, back in the days when um, everything was about eating fat-free and eating uh, as much plant-based as possible and eating whole grains, I used to, and I was, a, I was paying my way through graduate school as a personal trainer. There were only a couple of us back then. And I would literally eat every hour because I was eating carbs all day long. And I would get so hypoglycemic. <laughs> it was crazy. And I could not go more than a couple hours without eating. That's the first sign. If you've never forgotten to eat, you probably have an issue. If you're losing weight, but you lose nothing off your waist, that's probably you have an issue. Mm -hmm. If you feel like you ate and you're still hungry, probably an issue, or you're having cravings, especially for carbs, probably an issue. And the reason that this is happening is if you've got higher insulin levels than you should, and you know, we, we focus so much on blood sugar, but blood sugar is a lagging indicator. Really, we need to be looking at other markers like HOMA IR and especially mm -hmm. insulin, you know, just fasting insulin to see how our body's doing with this. If your fasting insulin is higher than it should be, or if you're eating a higher carbohydrate diet or a high carb, high fat diet, the most obesogenic diet there is, which is what my food the food guide pyramid and my plate are designed yep. that way. They are designed as a high, you know, they're designed as an obesogenic diet, which is so crazy. Um, if you're eating that way, insulin is going to be higher than it should be. And anytime you've got that situation, you've got a couple problems. You've got doors to your fat cells locked. You can't use stored fat for fuel. You've got more inflammation which is then going to create more insulin resistance. And also it's going to put the brakes on your body's ability to build muscle. So you've got to like, in order to fix this situation, you fix the insulin resistance, but it's those signs. And especially, I think one of the key biomarkers we need to be looking at is taking a waist measurement and putting it relative to our height and seeing where things are and really monitoring that. Like we've got to stop using a scale independently as a biomarker, we've got to look at the scale in terms of bioimpedance and what's, how much is, is lean mass, how much of that mass is skeletal mass, and then where's our waist measurement in that so that we can really make sure that as we're making these body composition shifts, they're going in the right direction. Yeah. I'd also like to note that when we think of people who are insulin resistant, we mostly think of people who are in the obesity category. And I'm actually insulin resistant. I'm pre-diabetic and I am very lean and muscular. And I have half a thyroid, which is what makes it very difficult for my body. And so I want to just state that lean, thin people can also be insulin resistant, which is why when you're talking about certain tests like HOMA IR and fasting glucose and fasting um, insulin, it's so important to look at all of these biomarkers and work with a doctor who is not going to give you a hard time about getting all these biomarkers taken so right. that you can really get the full story of your metabolic health. Well, if you've got now, what is it close to 80% of the population is overweight or obese and less than 7% is metabolically healthy. Obviously mm -hmm. there's some people who are normal weight right. with some metabolic dysregulation. So it's not like you have to unpack these things yes. where uh, quite often someone who is obese also has insulin resistance, not always quite often someone who's normal weight, maybe, you know, but not always. So you got to look, look, and you know, it's, it's crazy, Jill, because we have so many great, we have so many great tests now that we just don't use. Right. Which are such early predictors. We're using these things that are lagging indicators. You know, you don't wake up one morning insulin resistant. 
No, not at all. And we're going to talk about those tests. I have those um, down towards the middle of this podcast, which are so important. But before we jump down there, I want to ask you, how does menopause affect a woman's metabolic health? Because there are so many women that I work with who up until the time of perimenopause and menopause, they have never had an issue with their weight. They continue to eat a healthy or semi-healthy diet, do their exercise routine. You know, everything was going very smooth. And all of a sudden it stops and things change. Yes. You know, in a perfect world, we would make sure that in our teens, twenties, thirties, we were focused on laying down as much muscle as we possibly could. And we weren't afraid we were going to get too big because in all my years of working with women, I've never had a woman get too big weight training. I haven't seen it happen. I mean, maybe if they were taking steroids and all that, it's just physiologically not possible. Um, and going into your forties, you would really focus on having the best adrenal health possible, because if you're like most women in their forties, this is when you're, you've got your kids and they're doing all sorts of things you're working and, you know, somehow we, you know, things shifted for women where all of a sudden we're working, but the other jobs that we used to do didn't change. So, you know, right, we're working and we are running the household and we're the CEO of the household and we're working. It's a hugely stressful time. And when we are stressed out and our cortisol is dysfunctional, especially if it's going high we start stealing from progesterone and we start getting all, and, and that's the worst time it could possibly happen because we know with menopause, cortisol tends to go high anyway. And now we're stealing from progesterone. Now we're going to get more dysregulated. Uh, so that's part of the problem. Insulin can tend to go high too, especially if we're starting to lose estrogen, then we can become more insulin resistant. Um, so that's happening. We're starting to lose muscle mass starting around 35, 40. We lose up to 1% of our muscle mass a year. We lose even more strength and power. And so even though they say that women's metabolisms, like they did all this research and metabolism doesn't shift till like 60. It, to me, that's also looking at the bank account model, because again, we're looking at the whole chemistry lab. And if all of a sudden the hormones that were helping you stay more insulin sensitive and burn fat are down, you are not able to, you're losing muscle, which muscle is one of the most important things for metabolism and insulin sensitivity. Of course, things are going to start to go sideways. And let's not forget that as this is happening, one of the biggest places we start to see problems is in sleep. And we mm -hmm. know that even one poor night of sleep sets you up for being more insulin resistant the next day, having elevated ghrelin, so you're hungrier and better at storing fat. And you're not hungrier for salmon. Let's be real. So, and then that becomes a chronic thing. So you've just got everything set up for you to start adding more fat and especially adding visceral adipose tissue, the worst type of fat. So then would you say to that woman, the first place to start would be on their diet or stress or sleep? If you're saying that you really like to start with one thing at a time, what would you put in that number one spot? So if I was working with them one-on-one, -on -one, I would look at what the top priority is. Independent of that, if I had to pick one thing where I see women really failing is in protein. Mm, yep. So like my next book is three simple things. Eat protein first and lift heavy things and sleep like a baby, right? And so think about in most women's diets, the average woman now is getting somewhere between 40 and 65 grams of protein a day. Yeah. The reality is that's like half to a third of where they really need to be because they should be eating 0.7 grams to one gram per pound of their target body weight. And they need to eat that in a three divided doses. The other thing that I'm concerned about is as women are under more stress, they've got adrenal issues going on, hormone dysfunction, and then they go in and they decide I'm going to be on an intermittent fasting ketogenic diet. And then they really mess things up. If you're trying to lose body fat and you're eating a bunch of, and I see women gain weight on keto all the time, like all the time, because they think they can just eat as much fat as they want. But if you're eating fat, your body doesn't need to burn off stored fat. It's got fat. So it makes no sense to me. What I love about starting with the approach of eating protein first and eating it based on how much you need per your target body weight 
and dividing that so that your first and last meals are your best meals, you know, so you're getting at least 30 grams. So you're triggering, you're getting enough to trigger mTOR to make muscle protein synthesis is that when you start by eating protein first, you aren't hungry. Like you really have to work. Like for me at 140 pounds, I'm getting in 40 to 50 grams of protein at breakfast and, and dinner. And then somewhere in like the 30 grams at lunch, I'm full. Like it is, I have to really focus on getting that in and I'm yeah. done. Like, you know, and so when I start there, it makes it a lot easier. The research shows that people who eat protein first tend to make healthier food choices, again, because they're more satiated. Um, they, it's more thermic. So if you shift someone's, someone's protein ratio in their diet up just a little bit, like let's say you bumped it from 12% to 20%, they will lose weight. It's more thermic. Um, so it's a huge difference. So that's where I like to start is just that piece. And there's also this very interesting hypothesis by these bug researchers, this protein leverage hypothesis that found that people who, that we will continue to eat in order to get enough protein in our diet. So that person coming in, who's eating the plant-based diet with, you know, all the best intentions, not realizing that our, our diet over the last couple decades has, has gone to like 85% plant-based. We are sicker than ever yep. because it's, we're not sitting here eating more, you know, kale, broccoli, and cauliflower. No, we're eating kale chips that have chocolate chips on them, which in, you know, this kind of garbage junk food that's posing as health food. So that's my very first one is to start eating protein first. Cause I know that will help them retain lean mass as well. So will be a big difference helps with bone mass too, helps with depression too. So start there. I'm so aligned with you on that. It is the exact same place I start with my clients. And I can tell you that that number you said that women are mostly eating around 40 to 65 grams of protein a day is exactly the number that I see with my clients. And it is so difficult to have the conversation to start at protein and help them realize that this is going to be a great first step for them because many of them are coming from the mindset of Weight Watchers or uh, Nutrisystem where they're counting calories, where it's ca calories in, calories out. And so what does that conversation look like for you if you had to have that conversation with the client where they're coming from this point system, it's, mm -hmm. you know, dedicated meals to a certain number. It's, there's no mindfulness around the macronutrients. Right. Well, if it was working, they wouldn't be sitting with me. That is true. <laughs> I mean, that's over the right. years for any conversations I've had to have when someone wanted to argue of like, no, I don't want to lift weights early on, Jill. We were taught in graduate school, do not let people lift weights until they've done cardio and gotten the weight off. I go, that is the dumbest thing I've ever yeah. heard. You know, so like there's been just these silly things all throughout. And I just look and I go, well, if this is working for you, then fine. And then they have to look and they go, oh, it's not working. I go, well, you can be insane <laughs> or we can give this a shot. And you know what? Give me a week. We did a trial with our team one week. So this is all I want, just one week, one week, you're going to eat protein three times a day. Oh my gosh, you're not going to eat one meal a day. No, if you're eating one meal a day, like I just ran into someone who was, has been eating one meal a day for a year. She looks like she's aged 10 years. Like, she, you know, lost her muscle. She's soft. I was like, what the heck? You know, that's a technique that is strategy you could use, you know, maybe every week or every month. This is not a daily thing here. So, you know, that's the thing. It's like, if it's working for them, great, but it's not. Otherwise they wouldn't be here. And, and if you try this for one week, it's shocking. Like you shocking. will feel a difference. I would and that's, agree. You know, that's what I loved about Virgin Diet was I knew that if I put someone on it for one week, they go, oh my gosh, like what a difference. And then they get the buy-in. You do point system for a week. All you are is hungry, right? Yes. Yes. You know, I'm a carnivore coach as well. And um, I was a carnivore, a true carnivore for a couple of years. When uh, the pandemic hit, I wanted to test it out on myself. And I gained mm -hmm. a lot of information about myself, um, especially around how much protein my body really did need in order to thrive and hit the health goals that I wanted. And in the carnivore space, because I do coach some carnivores as well, and the women 
a lot of them come to me and they're eating one meal a day. And meanwhile, they're, it, they don't feel good. They have hormonal imbalances, hair loss, um, which also I, I do a lot of coaching in the hair loss space because I myself have been on a hair loss journey for probably 25 years and have finally reversed it. Um, but eating one meal a day to me, I, I am aligned with you on that and that it causes a lot of, a lot of health issues long-term yeah. and women cannot get in all of the protein mm. that they need. And it's, you know, we're not the Flintstones. We don't sit down and eat a tomahawk steak. It's just impossible. You, it, like you said, it is the most satiating macronutrient. It is impossible. It also, because it is so satiating, it's going to shut off their their gorilla and their hunger signal. And then they're going to be in a larger caloric deficit than that's what's really needed, which is also going to play a negative impact on their metabolic health. Yes. I think there's a couple important points and having been in this space for so long and having so many friends who are diet book authors, one of the things I notice is diet book authors write the diet that works for them, <laughs> right? You know, yeah, or sense. for them at the time. Right. Just because it's working for them at the time doesn't mean it will work for you. Diets are tools. They're tools. So it's your job to figure out what's best for you. You know, I think that there's some absolutes around protein. Mm -hmm. And then I think that we also like my issue with carnivore, car, carnivore is fiber and microbiome. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, that we need to have non starchy vegetables and a little fruit. Beyond that, you know, it's like, how much fat should you have? How many carbs? Hey, it depends on you. It depends on your genes. It depends on your lifestyle. It depends on what's going on with your hormones. You know, there's not one set thing for everybody on any of this kind of stuff. Absolutely. So, you know, I think it's really important for us to really reframe that diets are tools and, yes. you know, and also the other, other part of that is we are not small men. We have an entirely different hormone system than men. I think that if we put ourselves back 10,000 years ago, we weren't the ones going out and hunting and out all day long and having to be able to sustain ourselves on one meal. You know, like we were in, we store fat. We have, we have tended to 12% essential fat on our body. Men only have three to 5%. We are, we have an entirely different setup of where we store fat and the, the receptors of storing fat. So we can store fat to nurse. Like we are different, <laughs> you know? And so this idea that we would, we would follow the same diet and it would work well for us. They're not cycling, you know, they're not cycling. They're not the same. I have four sons and they are all big athletes. And I can tell you that there's no way, no how I could ever eat like them. <laughs> it would not happen. Let's talk about fruit consumption, because I think there's a lot of misinformation about fruit. A lot of people, there are people in one camp that say, don't eat too much fruit because it is sugar at the end of the day. And then there are other people who say, eat as much fruit as you want. In, in, is, even if you're on a weight loss journey, what is your um, professional opinion on how fruit plays a role in midlife women's metabolic health? So when I wrote Sugar Impact Diet, I really was looking at, you know, I, I felt like we needed to look at sugar differently. All carbohydrates, yes, all carbohydrates turn to sugar, except for fiber, it's handled differently. You know, we will absorb some. Um, and I really wanted to look at, unpack the difference between glucose and fructose, because ultimately we're going to have one or the other. Mm -hmm. um, and go, all right, how should we be eating? The big, big takeaway, sometimes I think we might major in the minors, you know, where we're worrying about fruit and yet we're eating all of this processed garbage over here, right? Like we're eating the chips and the healthy cereals and all this garbage. So first step is get rid of the ultra processed foods. The high, and you know, you're eating them if you want more of them problem, right? You know, right. never once have I gone, God, I pigged out on broccoli. I cannot believe I ate that much <laughs> ever. Right now with fruit, because it's really with carbohydrates. Yeah. I think we do better. Like in my perfect world, you're getting at least five servings of non starchy vegetables a day. A serving is one cup of raw or a half cup of cooked. That's at least that's minimum. That's the floor. Um, I really try to go for 10 and I really try to go as diverse as possible. I love this thing Dr. Sarah Ballantyne's cooked up this Nutrivore score where she's really looking at like 
you know, all of that. And Deanna Minnick's another one that they've just got great intel on diversity and how important it is. So that's the first thing is don't be a little food ready person. It's so easy to do. I do it myself. Mm -hmm. So that's step one. And then the next thing is to add, and I'm a fan of about two fruit servings a day. The only time I'm a little iffy about it is if someone's super, like they are diabetic and we're turning it around. Um, but even then it's just like, let's get to the lowest fructose fruits because the research is really clear. This is not what's creating the problem right. because they are packed with phytonutrients and fiber. It's an entirely different situation. If you're taking, unwrapping that fruit and having apple juice, apple juice is as bad as a Coke in my book. Um, apple juice, concentrate jams, syrups, dried fruit, all that stuff off the table, but fresher frozen fruit. I think two servings a day are really important to have and to, to do a diversity of them and always get in a berry every single day. Super important. Um, what I like to say about fruit is it's not free food. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I remember, <laughs> I can't remember what I was doing, but I was in Palm Springs. And I went to Costco and I bought like a pound, like the, or that big two or five pound box of cherries and proceed to eat the whole thing, you know? And so that's the example of what not to do with fruit. You got to, right. you got to still measure it and know your portions on all these things. And we tend to completely underestimate how much we eat. So I'm a huge food tracker fan to help you get that back in track again. But I would like the, I, I have people do two servings. If you're super athletic, you can go to three. That's it. And what about how to eat fruit? You know, eating fruit on its own is probably not the best place, the best way to eat it, but alongside some healthy fat or some protein? Is that what you would suggest? So I, I still remember, you know, I've been around for every single diet. It feels like, cause I've been doing this since the eighties. And I remember that one where it was like, you had to eat it. There was the pineapple diet. Then there was the grapefruit diet and the fruit, on, fruit only and the fruititarian. Um, I do not like snacking. So I think you should eat three meals a day yep. that that meal should have protein first, eat protein first eat your non-starchy vegetables. You're going to get some healthy fats in with your protein because you're getting clean sources. You'll probably use some extra virgin olive oil with your non-starchy vegetables. And then beyond that, you know, that's where I might throw in fruit, like at the end of it, cup of berries. I like to do a cup of blueberries with a tablespoon of dark chocolate from chips from Lily's. That's like my total, like this is the best. Um, or maybe in the morning, a cup of fruit and a smoothie. Like it's pretty easy to do. So that's where I tend to put it in. I wouldn't just go have a piece of fruit on its its own. I don't think it's the worst, worst thing. If you've got great blood sugar control, it'll come back down if you're having just one, but I'd rather see you do like maybe some fruit and nuts, but I'd really rather just you have breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Absolutely. I agree. I like to call mini fast between breakfast and lunch and lunch and dinner. And I actually refer to them as meal one, meal two, and meal three, because essentially they can all look somewhat alike. Yeah. You know, in the United States, we think of breakfast as French toast and pancakes and all these, you know, sweets, but it really shouldn't look very different from lunch. I, I lived in Japan and breakfast in Japan was an entirely, it was like fish, rice, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. pickled vegetables, took a while to get used to. And they would put the fish with their eyes in there. I was like, oh my gosh, where's the, just give me some coffee, you yeah. know, but um, it is ridiculous what breakfast is like in the U S that's why, honestly, I use smoothies because I, I just feel like so many people blow it at breakfast and I need to make sure that they get in the protein, the healthy fat, the fiber, that's going to be the satiety trifecta to keep their blood sugar stable so that they don't bonk. Yeah. I want to circle back to cortisol and chronic stress and how this has played such a negative role in women's metabolic health. Um, lots of people can start with the nutrition, start with the protein and find it somewhat challenging. Maybe some people find it easier than others, but stress is a whole nother ball game and helping people reduce their stress and to see how that's going to play a role in their metabolic health can be really difficult. And so could you just break down how, when you have high cortisol, how that really impacts our blood sugar, what that pathway looks like? You know, before this was really a thing 
And even before I, I, I was, uh, before I took my first adrenal salivary index test, I started to notice something in clients. And this was like 20 plus years ago. I was like, this is so weird. Their triglycerides look great. Their HDL looks great. So I know it's not a diet thing, right? Because if it was a diet thing, we'd figure their triglycerides would be up, but their blood sugar is like 110. What is going on? What's up with this? Insulin was fine. Even hemoglobin A1C would be okay. And that's when I was like, this, this has got to be stress. And fortunately, I met a lab company that isn't even around anymore, where, and they taught me the adrenal salivary index, and I started doing them, and, and uh, <laughs> mainly on myself first to go, holy smokes, what a mess, right? Because how would you know? I mean, you know, in our society, we, it's like we honor stressed out people and overworking, right? Yeah. Maybe not so much since the pandemic, but certainly prior to that. And what's been really interesting, like if you've got elevated cortisol, you're going to end up with belly fat. It's just going to happen. So elevated cortisol, I mean, a, a couple different things. You get stressed out. Your body thinks, holy smokes, I got to run away from this tiger. And then it's going to release stress hormones to break down muscle to quickly get blood sugar. First, ideally it's getting it's getting blood sugar from your muscles, but if there's mm -hmm. not, you know, and ideally it's getting blood sugar from your liver, but it can also break down your muscle to do this too. But bottom line, it's raising your blood sugar. Well, if it's raising your blood sugar, then it's going to raise your insulin too. And all this mm -hmm. says store more visceral adipose tissue. Mm -hmm. Also, if that's happening, that's going to impact your thyroid function and it's going to impact your progesterone. So it starts messing with every single thing. And the challenge is when it first starts happening, it, it makes you feel a little bit more wired. So you're like, oh, I just feel a little bit more energized. And then you might start using more coffee to keep that feeling going. You don't really mm -hmm. start to notice there's a problem until you all of a sudden either can't sleep. You're starting to get some belly fat that you never had before. You're having trouble building muscle. Maybe your sex drive's going, right? And you're craving sugary foods. Your gut's gotten leakier. So you feel more inflamed and reactive. All these things happen because of that stress. All of these things, it's, it's wild. But until you test, and this is where I love this adrenal salivary index, it's super intangible. And one of the challenging things, I remember I had a client early on and she looked to me from my, from my side, where I was now a single mom, really struggling financially, working my butt off um, in school, working and on TV and single mom and, you know, like, and, 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 and she lived in this huge house. Her husband was a doctor. She didn't work. And she was preparing for her daughter's bat mitzvah. And she was so stressed. She was, it was taking her health down. And I couldn't, I was like, and it made me, it was such a good reminder that, that this is so individualized. That for her was the tiger chasing her, right? Where we all have different levels of stress tolerance and resilience. And this is why it's so important to take care of yourself and not try to work like a man, but also build your stress tolerance, build your stress resilience to get there. But I think the adrenal salivary index is such a great thing because it's really hard to convince someone of this challenge <laughs> unless you can show them, look at this and they can yes. see it and go, oh, I get it. I remember yes. I tested an attorney and I said, I want to test you on a day that you're going into the courtroom on a very challenging trial. And his, his cortisol was like flatlined. I go, do you realize like, like this should be higher than normal, not flatlined during this time. So, you know, I think it's one where we really do need to show someone the test so they can see it. Now, this, this is one that I have battled with off and on for years. And finally, during the pandemic, because I had time, I decided I was going to start going to Dr. Joe Dispenza retreats. and the first retreat just made me realize how really bad I was at this stuff. And I wasn't getting anywhere. Everyone around me was having these amazing experiences. And I'm like, you know, he talks about breaking the habit of being yourself. This was, I was, didn't break anything. I was like, just, you know, having this in my head struggle. And at the end of that, I thought, you know, this is like taking your nervous system to the gym. And I think when you really look at health, and I talk about eat protein first, lift heavy things, sleep through the night. Well, sleep through the night really is what do we need to do for our nervous system? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's obvious, oh, we need to walk. We should, we need to lift weights. We, you know, but 
it's less obvious what you need to do for your nervous system. Cause you can't like, it's hard to see, maybe you look mm-hmm. at your HRV, but it doesn't really make any sense. Mm-hmm. So I started the meditation thing and I just decided, you know, I'm going to treat this like, as if I was starting, starting working out for the first time ever, I would never tell a client, do it for a week, go all into an immersive retreat. You're done. Check the box. I'd say, give it six months and fully commit. And that's what I did. And what was wild, two things happened. Number one, my chronic shortness of breath that I'd had from age 25 on, literally that I thought I'd had adult onset asthma. I went to the doctor. He's like, no, you don't. You have anxiety. I go, no, I don't. You know, (laughs) and uh, that was, that was crazy, but I lost five pounds. Now I don't change anything. I'm very like, you know, I eat the same way, exercise, and I'm like, what the heck? And I sit and talk and talk to Dr. Joe. He goes, it's the no thing diet because he talks about you're going to become nowhere, nobody, no thing. And it's just my body got out of flight and fight. Hmm. But it took, I was one of those people that goes, I hate meditation. And, you know, I actually went to um, my buddy Dave Asprey's 40 years of Zen because he said it's 40 years of meditation in, in a week. I'm like, perfect. Right. That wasn't the point of it. It was, you know, it's like I missed the memo, you know? So the game changer that has been, and that's why when someone goes, I can't meditate, I go, then learn to. It's just like, I don't have time to exercise, make time. I mean, either make time or you lose your whining rights. You're going to be the person that at 70 or 80 can't get out of the chair, needs help getting off the toilet, or you'll be one of those people who's 65 plus. I mean, right now, 50 to 60 year old women, 11% of them are, have sarcopenia, low muscle mass. Mm-hmm. And, you know, 65 plus you break a hip 50% of the chance you will not make it through the year. So like we have to change those things. So maybe you don't like to exercise. Well, learn to, right. Maybe you don't like to meditate, learn to try breath work, try sound healing, figure it out. You know, you, I don't like to floss. Do you? I still I make actually do. Floss. I actually do. do. I used to not like to floss and now I really love to floss. <laughs> wow. I don't like it, but I still do it. Like I do right. it every day. I right. do my flossing. Um, so, you know, it's like, that's what I look at. Like some of this adulting stuff we don't like, you still do it. Yeah. I don't love to meditate either. It was a very difficult one for me to wrap my head around. I had tried and failed many, many yeah. times. And in our health coaching, um, education classes years ago, we had to, they always brought someone on to help us meditate and learn how to breathe properly. And it was always not very fun for me that I I sort of just sort of checked out during those moments. Mm -hmm. But recently I, years ago, I got a red light therapy machine Mm-hmm. And our device, and I sit in front of it every day. And I thought to myself, well, every day I sit in front of it for 15 minutes and I close my eyes and I do nothing. And so that was my meditation. I said, so now I'm just going to turn it into my meditation red light therapy Perfect. routine. And now it's my new normal. See, and I have I have no idea if I'm doing it right or wrong, but I'm doing it. There isn't something. a right or wrong. That right. is the biggest thing. I think that's the challenge with meditation, is yeah. you're like, it didn't happen. It's like nothing happens. Right. Right. I, I find using the guided one works so much better for me, but then I'm like, I kind of go off and then I come back and it works great. So nothing, there is no right or wrong, you know, did you just do it? So you're doing it. Yeah. So you, and it, it's, that's exactly how we establish these lifestyle changes. Everything is one step at a time slowly but surely everything will become your new normal and you'll look back on the six to 12 months prior and think gosh I can't believe I actually lived like that and it's not that hard I'm doing it I'm in it exactly yeah yep. well JJ it has been a pleasure having you on the podcast today I know that there is a large midlife women's community of mine waiting to hear this episode and have all these golden nuggets to walk away with and implement in their own life. Is there anything else you would like to share with us about metabolic flexibility that we didn't cover in, in a, in a nugget? It's more of a bigger vision thing because I really look at this time. And I think like, when you look at aging, there was a study that came out that said people who are excited about aging, who have positive thoughts about aging live seven and a half years longer like this is wild over those who don't. 
And I just turned 60 and I literally decided that I was going to get in the best shape of my life for my 60th birthday. And I got so fired up. First of all, I revisited what I did over the past decade because we tend to go, I did nothing happened, right? You know, so I went and did all the like, what's what was accomplished from 50 to 60? And then I got really fired up onto what, where do I want to, what do I want to have happen in my 60s? What is this expansive decade? And I really believe this is like, the best time because, Hmm. you know, kids are older, uh, you know, go through menopause and you don't have to deal with that anymore. Like there's a whole bunch of really fabulous stuff, but society has us aging gracefully. And the big message I want to get out there is like, forget aging gracefully, forget it. This is the time to age powerfully. This is the time to do the things you've always wanted to do to, you know, show up strong, speak up for yourself and, you know, just have the most powerful time of your life, right? That's it. Age powerfully. I love that. And for those of you who are going to watch this on my YouTube channel, you're going to see how unreal JJ looks at 60. You've ripped arms. You're I do. Skinny. I just, you're, I you do. pushed them even harder. Unbelievable. Like pull-ups, push-ups. <laughs> I just Unbelievable. Like, and your oof. skin is glowing and it's just the whole, the whole, pa- oh, excuse me, the whole package. Well, and thank I, you I, very much. Yes. Mm. And I tell my clients all the time, when you're the client and we're the coach and you look at us and think we have it down and it's so easy, it's not. We all come to the table with our own struggles. I have my own struggles. I'm sure you have your own struggles. It is not easy stuff to do every day. Every day I wake up and I have a plan and I try to execute it as best as possible. And some days just don't look the way I wanted them to look, but Mm-hmm. Oh, well, just go on to right? the next day. Yep. So Move on. I love those words of wisdom <laughs> for you. Uh, age like a rock star. And thank you again for all of your generosity and your time today. And um, it was absolutely wonderful. I have to have you back so we can talk more about women's health. If you'll come back. Yes. Everything to support, like everything I'm doing now is, is 40 plus you know, how do we make this awesome. absolutely the best thing ever? I'm completely 100% committed to it. So yes. Wonderful. Wonderful. So where can my community find you if they want to check out all of your free resources and information? JJVirgin.com. Awesome. Easy. Awesome. I will put all of that. I know you have a bunch of social media. You have a lot of books, programs, and products. And I'll put all of that in the show notes for everyone to check out as well. So thank you again, JJ. Awesome meeting thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining me. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Lifestyle changes can be hard and overwhelming to make. By building your support team of functional medicine doctors, therapists, and health coaches, you can reach your optimal health goals. Be sure to check out my other podcasts. Until we meet again, stay healthy.